channel you're watching me live on hinduscriptures.com facebook page and uh, that is happening through zoom so as uh, promised earlier we have a very eminent guest today uh, sir uh, jeffrey armstrong ji jeffrey ji namaste are you there with me namaste vaishali i am yeah uh, jeffrey ji before we start our session i usually do a small okay. prayer so i would like to request you um, uh, you know to recite Namaste, yes. everyone. Welcome Hello. back, Jeffrey G. I just narrated your small introduction to our audience. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have to start our session with a small prayer. So uh, I would like to request you to do a small prayer. Certainly. Well, since it's Navaratri, we'll right. start with Ganesha. Um, Ganesha Sharanam, Sharanam Ganesha, Ganesha Sharanam, Sharanam Ganesha, Ganesha Sharanam, Sharanam Ganesha. The mother loves us if we love her son. And then for Ma Durga, who we are honoring for these nine days, Om Pradhamam Shaila Putricha, Dviti Yam Brahmacharini, Triti Yam Chandra Ganteti, Kushman Deti Chaturtakam, Panchamam Skandamateti, Shashtam Katyayaniti Cha, Saptamam Kalaratriti, Mahagauri Shashtamam, Navabam Siridatri Cha, Navadurga Prakirtita, Oktanye Tani Namani, Brahmanaiva Mahatmana. Thank you, Vaishali, for having me on today. Be kind of you. In fact, it's truly our pleasure that you agreed to have this session, and I'm so happy to uh, uh, know about your new book, the latest book, Gita Comes Alive. It's very interesting. The title is very interesting. So before we start our journey of this conversation, I would like to know something about your background. How did you start? You are born in different parts of the world, but you are, yet you are so uh, Indian, you are so Hindu, and you are so uh, passionate about Hindu scriptures. So please share something about your journey. Well, I guess there are times in history when we get to see what Bhagavan says in the Gita. In chapter 7, verse 19, Bahunam Janmanamante, Nyanavan Mam Prapadyate, Vasudeva Sarvamiti, Samahatma Sudurlabaha. So, our skin color truly is the coat of paint on our car, and, uh, or karana, as we say in Sanskrit. So, at this moment in history, it appears to me that millions of yogis who obviously were practicing in Bharat, in India, have now been sent out. To different places around the world in disguise in the skin of different cultures. So it looks to me like that's what is happening at this moment. I started at a quite young age not being happy with the Western civilization and its wars and its lies and its culture in the many ways that it could not tell the truth. So I became a truth seeker and if you become a truth seeker you will end up at the Vedic Library. That is very true, but uh, what actually got you into Hindu scriptures? Because even if, um, you know, I've seen quite a few Westerners, they, they start with yoga and they usually end there, you know, to know uh, when it comes to the Indian uh, side of, uh, you know, knowledge. So how did you put into so, so far and for so long? Why did I go so deep into Vedanta? Well, again, everyone is at a different stage of evolution. For me, I was a psychology major and a literature poetry major. and I was a poet and philosopher from a quite young age, starting at age 13. I began questioning everything, writing poetry. So by the time I got to university, I was dissatisfied. And that dissatisfaction is what leads you if you're paying attention and you really want to learn, you don't think I'm going to learn my culture. You think I'm going to learn the truth. 
And by doing that, you will end up, no matter what subject I studied, I ended up in India. If I looked into science, I ended up in India. Just do a little research. If I looked into language, Sanskrit led to India. If I looked into anything. So it didn't take very long for me to see that. And of course, I have a little joke about this, that after the British colonized India and took just about everything, the gurus came to the West and said, wait, you forgot the crown jewels. You forgot the most beautiful part. Here, take our knowledge. And I was the recipient of that knowledge from some of the great gurus that came across. And, and that was what really sparked me. And you have to be initiated. So I was initiated, became a brahmachari, spent five years in an ashram, sleeping on the floor, serving my guru. So this was my entrance and true initiation into the Vedic culture. Very interesting. If I, uh, I I am currently in Mumbai, a city which is you know always buzzing, extremely busy, large, multicultural. But if I go uh, and walk around, even for uh, say for example, if I go say one kilometer or two kilometer, I'm very sure I won't find even one person uh, who is able to recite <laughs> Durga prayers the way you have recited. So I think uh, when it comes to knowledge and it comes to religion, it comes to see, being, you know, seeker, I think the skin color has uh, that, you know, is, that logic of skin color has disappeared. I feel yeah. it's, it's whether um, you're born in India, you're born anywhere in the world. If, if you are a true seeker, you can find your ways. So uh, tell me something more about the scriptures you have studied, how and why, and what did you find mainly? I want to know your point of view about what did you learn from, from the Hindu scriptures, various scriptures. I'm sure you, apart from Bhagavad Gita, I'm sure you have learned something else as well. So please tell me something more in details about the philosophy, what you think, what you have learned and what you would like to share. Well, chronologically, after doing five years at university, with, I was moving on toward a degree in psychology. And I was a truth seeker. So I knew that my professors had only a little bit of that truth. I worked for three years at a metaphysical bookstore in the college town I was in, Ann Arbor, Michigan. And there I read every book in the bookstore. And many of them were about India and from various gurus in various directions. So I began to see the magnitude of the knowledge that was there in the many subjects. I became an, a Western astrologer as well. So when I finally entered the ashram, then it, it was Vedanta. It was going all the way across that occurred. So then I became the proofreader for my guru's books to help bring them into English, even though I didn't know Sanskritam. So, but that got me started on the journey of trying to translate and bring across the gifts of Sanskrit, which I had experienced directly and firsthand by them. And I knew that the Shabda Brahman, I knew that the Vedic library was this higher truth that had descended throughout history at various times. And of course, I knew by then of the Bhagavad Gita and was helping to translate the Bhagavad Purana. So I was now deeply into the, the literary side of the culture. And that just kept going. I just kept reading. I read Shankara's commentaries and Madhva's commentaries. And I read everything I could read. But then I began to notice that all the translations were problematic. And because I was a poet and a linguist by nature, I started to grapple with this problem of bringing the Vedic knowledge into English. And that's a problem we still have in the world. And that's what I've been responding to by this new translation of the Bhagavad Gita as well. That we're in a process of bringing the Sanskrit wisdom out of Bharat and around the world. And this was intended when the Gita was spoken. It was for everyone. It was eventually to go out to every human being on the planet. That's very interesting. When I was um, reading the introduction that uh, you took 10 years. 
So how was the journey? Um, what are the things which you found in other Bhagavad Gita and how your translation work uh, or your commentary is different from others? Of course, we are not here to criticize anyone, but what is the difference basically in language, in concept? Well, you know, there are two things, Vaishali, that every Western person that I try to explain the Vedic knowledge to, I, I get, try to get them to understand. The first is that we've been cheated and told we only live for one life. Yeah. And this has been a technique to make everyone afraid, to make them into sheep and to make them docile and manipulatable, to just first make them afraid, scare them with firing and brimstones and hell, tell them they only have one life and tell them they've got to do what they're told. So the first step of moksha is to realize that we're an immortal being that we came here on purpose, that we're not bad because we came here. And that we came here to have this experience, we're the Atma. So I have to insist upon the using of Sanskrit words because the, the word soul in English doesn't mean Atma and it doesn't mean many lifetimes and it doesn't mean that you're an immortal divine being who can't die. But it sure does help you relax when you realize that, when you realize that you actually can't die. So, when you begin to realize that, then you also begin to understand the concept of samsara, of going from life to life and growing. So what I began doing is renaming things into English terms that were useful. So I, I called the universe, the university. We're all in university. We're all in different grade levels. Somebody's in kindergarten. Somebody just came across from being an animal. Somebody's working on their PhD, and that's from their previous life. So they have that vidya inside of them, and at a certain point, it just wakes up. That's what the Gita says at a certain point. This is the discussion in chapter six of the Gita, where Arjun says, what if I fail in my yoga? Krishna says, well, then you come, you go to Svarga Loka for one lifetime. You'll have the Deva vacation, and then you'll come back and be born again in an appropriate family, and then... At a certain point, you'll wake up and resume your yoga exactly where you left off. So this continuity was one of the most important things. But what I began to notice was if you translate the Vedic knowledge into English, and if you're not careful, and it was intentional originally, you'll start speaking like someone from Great Britain, and you'll uh, be thinking that way too, and you'll only have a one-life worldview and you can't learn the Vedic knowledge that way. You have to become reborn by the guru. The saying is, as you probably know, that the guru is the father and the Veda is the mother. Sure. So I just jumped into this process, no doubt, where I was before. So after that, I studied Jyotish. So I spent five years in the ashram as a brahmachari, learned Vedanta, helped my guru translate his books, traveled the world teaching and helping people to understand the Vedic knowledge. And then I went, um, learned Jyotish from a guru of Jyotish from India who was living in England. And uh, he was Ravi Shankar's astrologer. This was back in the 60s. And I learned Jyotish. So I spent three years learning Jyotish. And before I learned it, he said, I'm going to give you the nine mantras to the Grahas. You have to chant each one 100,000 times. Mm -hmm. And then I'll teach you Jyotish. So I had to spend three months chanting 900,000 mantras to the grahas before I could be qualified, Adhikari, to learn Jyotish. So then I studied Jyotish. Then I went back to university, got a degree in history and comparative religion, studied Samskritam from a Benares pundit at the University of Hawaii, and wrote a thesis for graduation comparing Shankara to Madhva in their Vedanta. So, for me, this was like a fish back in, a, in the water. And I've been that way ever since. So about 23 years ago at age 50, I said, you know, there's really nothing else I want to do than teach the Vedic knowledge throughout the world. And that's what I've been doing ever since with my partner, Sandy. Interesting. So which part of Bhagavad Gita is your favorite? Which chapter or which chapter you can recite? Uh, I would like you to recite a few shlokas from Bhagavad Gita, because I want our audience to know your uh, grip on this subject. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you come in from the outside, the other thing is I, I'm not a pandita in Sanskritam. My guru was a Benares pandit 
who grew up memorizing the Ashtajaya Panini, and he knew all 4,000 grammatical rules by heart. Right. He'd say something in Sanskrit and he'd go, rule number 2,221. Uh, <laughs> so I am not Pandita. Right. Um, I had to go in the ashram, burn off my samskars from being born a meat eater and born in Western civilization, which I did successfully with the grace of my guru. But so then the next step is I was now a bridge between two cultures, civilizations, worldviews. And so for me, whatever was the most condensed version was helpful at the beginning. So I learned that in chapter 10, verses 8, 9, 10, and 11 are called the nutshell Gita. They summarize the whole thing. So uh, with that then, I said, oh, well, that's a good place to start. So aham sarvasya prabhavo matak sarvam pravartite iti madva bhajanti mam buddha bhava samanvita majtita madgata prana bodhiyantak parasparam kasiyantas chamam nityam tushanti cha romanti cha tesham satati yuktanam bhajitam priti purvakam dadami buddhi yogam tvam gena mam upuyanti te tesham evanukam parasam aham magyana jam tamaha I am the source of everything. For me, the entire creation flows. Knowing this, the wise adore me with all their hearts. Their thoughts dwell in me. Their lives are surrendered unto me. And they derive great satisfaction and bliss, enlightening one another and conversing about me. To those who are constantly devoted and adore me with purest love, I give the understanding by which they may come to me out of compassion for them, I who am dwelling within their hearts, destroy the darkness born of ignorance with the shining lamp of wisdom. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> okay. So um, I, as I understood that you are a linguistic expert as well, and you found uh, the root of many words in, um, in, in, you know, many English words in India, and I remember you have, you had mentioned as uh, Irish as Aryan, you think so? So is this the Aryan? Uh, okay, do you believe in that Aryan invasion theory? Or I'm sure, or maybe the Indians who went to Irish. <laughs> that was the Aryan diversion theory. It was created <laughs> in Oxford just to distract attention. Well, if you study linguistics, it actually gives you the secret because the, anyone who's a legitimate linguist and etymologist in Western academic culture has to admit that the European languages as we constantly know, consistently now know them in English came from Latin and Greek and then Sanskrit. Those were the three sources. German came from Sanskrit, the Romance languages came from Latin, but Latin and Greek came from Sanskritum. So they just renamed it Indo-Aryan so they could distract attention from the fact that it was Sanskrit. This was just a British strategy at Oxford but the fact is there is no Indo-Aryan language and there is no Indo-Aryan library, but there is a Sanskrit library and a Sanskrit language. And that Sanskrit language is perfect because it not only has the perfect, perfection of Panini's uh, 4,000 grammatical rules, but more particularly it's because of the uh, datus, because Sanskrit is based upon roots. Mm -hmm. And this is where etymology comes from. There is no Sanskrit without the datus that are the roots of all the words. So those roots don't, and this is the important term, they don't drift over time. Exactly. In all other spoken languages, which are less perfect, there's something called linguistic drift. And the most imperfect language in the world is English. Because English perfect is just, is the, is yes, it's just a hodgepodge. Please repeat this. Please repeat three times. <laughs> Yes, English is just a crazy salad of languages and words, and it, it's got it's great for having hundreds of thousands of words to describe objects, but it stole those words from the countries it colonized. But <laughs> what English does not have is good meaning. So the biggest problem that I noticed, what I really finally saw, was that this language whose meanings were perfect and clear and had lasted forever. Right, hadn't changed at all, was now trying to land in a language full of slang and drifted words 
and words that didn't mean what they said. So I began to see that I was going to have to sort this out to the best of my ability and that this could be my seva. This could be my service. Right. So it was How to take you... the colonizing language out of English yeah. and to bring the Sanskrit into English where there are no words that are, it's, that are saying what the Sanskrit word is saying. Right. There are so many words, for example, sanskaras, right? Sanskar. Um, there is no word, there is no exact word in English. So there are many, uh, for example, uh, three guna, like we have three guna inside our personality. So how do you, I have, uh, I've read uh, Bhagavad Gita of uh, Iskon, and I know they say three modes of nature, but I'm sure there can be a better way of explaining it, or maybe you just have to say three guna. So like that, there are many words. Please explain. I call it the three words. energetic states of nature. Right. That's so please accurate. explain. Yes. No, yes. Nobody knows what a mode is, but... Uh, uh, an energetic state is a more accurate description using English, but you can't substitute that for the three gunas because <laughs> gu, first of all, the, the, the material matter is called gu. So you need to know that first, that this dark stuff that we're covered in is actually called the gu, which is kind of appropriate because our atma is covered in gu. But I've never heard anyone from India say this exactly because they are not good in English. So here's the trick. If you get really expert in English, then you know which words are not useful and which ones are. And True. you know which ones go back to Greek or Sanskrit or Latin. And then at least you can sort out the mess. But then you also have to know enough Sanskrit to work with the English. And then you have to bring in the Sanskrit word like Atma, like Dharma, when you don't have an English word that's an equivalent. So right. you'll notice that my dear friend Rajiv Malhotra is doing a great job in talking about this for the world as well. Sure. He's, he's going at it from another perspective because he's coming from inside the culture. And essentially I'm the Rajiv, I'm the Caucasian Rajiv Malhotra. I'm coming at it from the outside of the culture supposedly, but from the inside outside. That is interesting, but why do you consider yourself outside? You think so? Have you got ever, ever have you ever got treated that way, or have you ever felt, or has? Well, I'm, I'm using it as I came from the outside, but I'm now on the inside. Yeah. Whereas he came from the inside and moved toward the outside, so he can talk to the Caucasian scholarly world, and I can talk to both worlds, and I'm a linguist, so. Uh, his specialty is political science and social science and seeing it from that perspective of colonization. Right. So, <laughs> right. so mine is to solve the problem hmm. by getting the appropriate mix of English. We can't throw English out. It's the means by which the whole world is being reached. But we can do what happened during the Renaissance, during Shakespeare's time and afterwards during the Italian Renaissance about four or 5,000 words were dropped into the English language, several thousand from Latin. Shakespeare invented a thousand words. So we're at another time in history where since all the cultures are mixing, we need to get the best- Sanskrit words into English directly as it is. That's right, exactly right. So that's what I'm in the midst of. I'm writing books about it, bringing them in. And this is what's allowed me to remove the colonizing terms from the Bhagavad Gita that never this should have been there. All, the, all the Christian terminology, sin, God, hell, heaven, all of that, angels, none of that should ever have been there. So I've just taken it out. And then there are reasonable English words based on Latin, based on the meaning is clearer. You can use those along with Sanskrit and this is the next step in the Renaissance of Vedic knowledge, is that we will bring a thousand Sanskrit words into English, which doesn't have them. Ved and now English will be able to speak about the Vedic concepts without distorting them, trying to make them into Christianity or modern science or just distorting them. True. Yeah, it's very important. And I think academia has a huge uh, power you know, and their power, uh, if it is used rightly, and that too with the help of right language, then it can make a good positive impact and good 
contribution to vedic knowledge otherwise till now it was kind of you know they were trying to distort the meaning downsize uh, you know uh, let's give your listeners let, let's give your listeners one example by so this was an important one for me as i was doing my etymological research i researched the meaning of the word god so okay. try this as an experiment everyone who's listening ask everyone you know the actual meaning of the word god it's okay. etymology, not just its everyday usage. In everyday usage, most people will use it according to what they think, but the words in a dictionary aren't defined by the user, they're defined by the dictionary. If you go to the English dictionary, the regular English dictionary, and look up the word God, it'll tell you various things, creator, supreme being, this, that, the other thing, but nothing specific. If you go to an etymological dictionary of the English language mm -hmm. to the right kind, and there only is one I know, and it's called origins. This particular dictionary goes back to the Latin, the Greek, first the European languages. So you follow a word back, then it goes to the Latin, then it goes to the Greek, and then he gives the Sanskrit. So now let's do that with God. So God came into the English language from German. Mm -hmm. You may remember I said German comes from Sanskrit, not Latin. Right. right. So the word in German is Gutam. In Dutch, it became Gut. Mm -hmm. And in English, it became God. But what Sanskrit word did it come from? It came from Brahmarpanam, Brahma Agna, Brahmaha. It came from Hutam, H-U-T-A-M, okay. which means that the Christian word God is the smoke arising from a pagan fire sacrifice. Right. <laughs> so the, we're the pagan. <laughs> That's us. That pagan means bagan. So yeah. when you put the offering into the Agni Hotra, the smoke that rises up from your offering, of thanks mm. is called hutam. Hutam, yes. So that is actually the same word as God in Christianity, but no Christians know that. And they should be embarrassed that they got the only word for the supreme being that they have. Whereas I think we have a few more. Vishnu Sahasranam, Om yeah. Vishvam Vishnu Vasatkaro, Bhuta bhavya bhavat prabahu, bhuta krit, bhuta krit bhava. Well, I could go on, but that's a thousand and eight names. Yeah. <laughs> there is no end to describe God. There is no end how you can de describe divine. Uh, it's endless. I mean, there is absolutely no, nobody can deny the names, uh, you know, we have in Vedic scriptures and that's right. Uh, I think in English, there is just one word, God. I have not noticed. Yeah, they... And it's not English, it's Sanskrit. So and this it... is the irony. And I'm the first person to bring this out. Is it was it... in the dictionary, but no one spoke about it. So I am the first human being to... in modern times to point out that it is awkward and embarrassing for Christianity that they only have one word for the supreme being. Yeah. And that one word is Sanskrit. And yet they avoid talking about the Sanskrit culture and they don't like it and so on. So this is the next step of the revolution. The post-colonial stage is to clean up your language. So everyone who's from India needs to learn this and needs to use the Sanskrit words and not the Christian words so that they don't call it our religion. They call it the Vedic Sanatan Dharma. It's not your religion. You don't have a religion. Religion is really gare. It's Latin and it means bound by rules. And the Vedas don't bind us by rules. And we don't have one because that's a Latin word. Very interesting. I don't know yeah. how many people like have you have you narrated this concept to people in any any open platform? What is the response? How many people are accepting it? I haven't had a chance to yet because I've been waiting to put the Gita out first so okay. that I could then make this an entire Renaissance campaign. So this is the new campaign. The next book is 108 Sanskrit words every yogi should know. 
Oh, very interesting. Very interesting. Please share and some what, of the words with us. I would like to know. At least well, certainly. And and they're in the glossary to the Gita also. So this is the other thing that we did with the Bhagavad Gita comes alive. It has a glossary in the back and it has about a hundred Sanskrit words mixed with the English words in the translation. So where there is no appropriate English word, we've used the Sanskrit. So we've used each one of the different words. So let's just do Dharma since everyone confuses Dharma with religion. Religion, yeah. Okay, so religion is re ligare. It's Latin and it mm -hmm. means liga, legal, ligatures in your body you have ligaments right there are things that bind and hold the body together so bound is ligature or legal you're bound by legality and so to be bound by rules is re ligari so the christian religion the jewish religion and the muslim religion bind you with a single book of rules and call themselves the people of a book. Right. We are the people of a library. <laughs> right. We don't have just one book. We have a library of books. That's what true. I like to say to people is I've read your book. Have you read any of our library? <laughs> That's the right way of to right very, yeah. very appropriate way of uh, saying that yeah. uh, we are not the student of one book. We have like thousands yes and those books are useful the way any library is because they're on various subjects that help us to do what so let's back to dharma so if dharma is not religion what is it well the root is ri not even dri but ri and the ri or the ritam are the laws of nature hmm. so we vedics we members of the vedic civilization look to understand the laws of nature, the ritam. And so from that comes a couple of very important words, the kri of karma and the dri of dharma. Right. Okay. Right. So that dri, D-H-R-I, now it's got the laws of nature embedded in it, keeping it honest, you could say. So then dri means the essential nature of a thing, which if you take it away, it is no longer itself. Here's water. Mm. If you take liquidity away, it is no longer water. True. So the dharma of water is to be liquid. The dharma of glass is to hold. So a dharma culture then looks to find out how nature's laws are working then aligns itself with those laws. And that's called, when it's the laws that are always true, it's called Sanatan Dharma. Right. When it's the laws that make up your particular body, that makes you good at particular things, that's called your Sva Dharma. True. Or one's own, Sva, yeah. one's own yeah. Dharma. Yeah. So Svadharma and Sanatan Dharma are built out of the Sanskritam. But there is no such building process, no such precision, no such concepts in English. So once you learn the word Dharma, then the next likely word to learn is Karma. <laughs> because if you go against the laws of nature, yeah. there will be a reaction. True. So action and reaction is the basis of karma, but it, it's actually not just action and reaction because it's involving the atma. And the atma cannot be killed and cannot die. So therefore, karma must be cause and effect over many lifetimes. True. But scientists say cause and effect is just right now, but that's only a naive childish view of cause and effect and so on. But what, okay, I, since you have mentioned Atma, I, I want to know um, what is the nearest word and the concept which is defined in Western world about Atma? Because they say soul, but when you say a for dictionary meaning of soul, it's not exactly in that, you know, meaning same as Atma. Uh, nowadays, they have used this word as consciousness, 
uh, you know, uh, that it doesn't <laughs> die. So what do you think about these theories? Well, first of all, they're un, un scholarly, but they're a step. These are a series of steps. So it's important to think of tra translation is Latin, it's translatio, and it means to carry across. So let's just think that the, all the Vedic wisdom is gold and we're trying to carry it across into English. So it takes a little bit of consideration of how to carry it across without losing its most essential nature. So when the word Atma went into Latin, it became Atome, which means you can't cut it. Atome, uncuttable. Uncuttable. And in the second chapter of the Gita, this is what Krishna says. He right. says, you can't cut it, you can't burn it, Enjoy. you can't kill it, you can't wet it, you can't blow it away with the wind, and so on. So atome became the English word atomic, which at first meant you can't cut it. But then we cut the atom. So then that became not true. <laughs> but the idea of uncuttable helps us have one little aspect of the Atma. But in fact, the Atma is Sat, Chit, Ananda, and Vigraha. There are other Sanskrit words that help us to understand the facets of our being. So our problem is thinking there is one English word, or even two or three, or 10, that will encompass the meaning of Atma. You have to go a group of words at a time. You can't cut it. You can't burn it, you can't kill it, you can't put it out, you can't extinguish it. It's an anantam, it, it, it doesn't end, it doesn't have a beginning. Mm -hmm. It's a chintya, you can't think it. Yeah. You think with a faculty called manas, manas but yeah. you don't yeah. think with your atma. Your uh -huh. atma has something called chit, which chit. is the consciousness that's reflecting down into matter. So we have to, become capable of using various Sanskrit words to paint a picture. So the truth of Sanskrit is that each deeply meaningful word requires a picture and not just a couple of words, yes, that is even true. a series of pictures from different angles. <laughs> Very so. true. Since you have mentioned about atomic, I just thought of a scientific aspect of scriptures. I would like you to narrate what kind of sci modern scientific topics you have found in uh, Bhagavad Gita. I mean, there are so many things which Krishna has described in that. So let's uh, pinpoint and give some specific names of modern science, which you have found in Gita. Well, let's go even to the root of that. It's a great question. And let's just say that science itself is Samkhya. Yeah. It isn't separate. It didn't do something to make itself. Mm -hmm. It received the knowledge of Samkhya from the Veda over history, over time, and pieces of those Sankhya uh, sutras from the Veda went into the various European languages, became the scientific revolution, became the Renaissance that occurred there. It was knowledge going across the Silk Road. So the fact is that for the last 10,000 years, China and India and all the cultures in between have been connected. And for at least the last 10,000 years, they've been exchanging language, knowledge, products, all kinds of things, ideas. So along that Silk Road, all kinds of scientific knowledge has been leaking out because that knowledge existed both in India and in China, just as Ayurvedic medicine existed 5,000 years ago, 7,000 years ago, and the Chinese say they got Chinese medicine from India, from Ayurvedic medicine, and mm. they know they also got martial arts. Mm. So the reason this conversation seems difficult for us is we believe the propaganda that Western civilization invented itself out of nothing, that they were just so smart that they invented themselves. But in fact, they stole things from all around the world and didn't say where they got them from and pretended they invented them and said, we invented this, it's called science. No, you didn't invent it, it's called Samkhya. And it's been going on in India for tens of thousands of years. And that's how we built the temples we built. That's how we did the, the, the many miraculous things culturally that we did. 
And we had airplanes, we had names called Vimana for airplanes. The, the Ramayan begins with Ravana flying in an airplane. <laughs> now, wait a minute, that's the oldest epic in Bharat. <laughs> and how does the first paragraph start out? Well, this man named Ravana was flying in an airplane and he was above the ground and he landed and did the following. Yes. So where did that science come from? So I'm afraid it's all backwards right now. We keep trying to explain ancient civilization in terms of modern arrogance. Which is a wrong way of doing, yes. And it's just arrogance and assertiveness on Western civilization's part and not honesty about history. But this is, Vaishali, this is a bigger problem that the Vedic community is starting to work on. There are many organizations in our Vedic community that are starting to work with First Nations groups in America and in Canada and throughout the world to help them revive their cultures. Because what really happened during colonization was all the cultures of the world were destroyed and damaged and robbed and pillaged. And this got started when the Pope sent out a message called a papal bull in 1540, in uh, 1450, sorry, before Columbus went out. And he said, anyone can go out in the world and discover a place and bring everything back for us. So in before Columbus, the Catholic Church invented something called discovery. And that was going where Christians didn't live and taking everything and making them Christian. So it's very important to know that the, the root of intimidation of thinking that Vedic civilization which has been renamed comes from Western civilization, that intimidation was the process of colonization. We're better than you, we're white, we're better than you, we're Christian, we're better than you, you're a primitive culture. By the way, we're gonna take everything you have and all your wealth and all your knowledge, and we're gonna discover it, we're gonna call it our own. So that's the actual technical, academic and legal term for what happened, discovery, it's called. So the fact is you're question is embedded in the problem yes. that we haven't gotten over the propaganda yes. and we're apologizing to Western science for not being as smart as them, whereas in fact, what they got came from India. And very and interesting. That, I wanted to hear it from you <laughs> rather than me it, saying that. <laughs> it's that that we have to say, yes, and that's one of my jobs. Wearing white skin, I can say this and it will land differently with the white-skinned people because they're prejudiced. The ones that are prejudiced, they're not all prejudiced, just like me, but there's, there's a whole group of people who don't care about skin or the color of the paint on their car. So uh, <laughs> they care about performance. That and is so true. That's what the Vedic civilization is. We care about what's inside. True. So I call this the namaste culture, but here's a good example. So what does namaste mean? You tell me. It's my soul which is bowing down to the soul which is residing into you. That is what uh, we mean. So you, see, you immediately went to Christian. Ter you immediately went to Christian terminology. <laughs> yes. So I have to say your definition is wrong. Wrong. Yes. Yeah. But nothing to do with my Christian soul because I don't have a Christian soul. Soul. True. Very true. Because a soul, you know, the word soul comes from the word sol, S O L, which means the sun. Mm -hmm. And the word soul means you only have one life, or rather it means you burn out after a while. The sun in the sky will burn out after a certain amount of time. So the Atma lasts longer than the sun in the sky does. Mm -hmm. The soul is just an, a sun in the sky of your body, but it's not even articulate. It came out of the Latin as soul, but in English, soul doesn't mean anything much. It's, it doesn't mean Atma. It certainly doesn't mean not. Very nice. And, this because it, uh, I, I've been trying to tell this to a lot of people, but then when I was trying to explain that Atma's definition is different than the soul, the dictionary de definition, I never went so deep like you that it comes from Latin and what research you have done. Of course, I did not know. But then also people are not ready to understand the difference between soul and Atma. So I'm glad that today we, we debunk this theory on this session because uh, lots and lots of people, even the Indians, I'm telling you, Indians you use the same word soul while describing Atma. It's a, it's a disease. It's a disease. And 
but you can remove it. It's curable. It's, 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 uh, it, I won't call it a pandemic, but let's say it was a scamdemic because the, the colonizers taught everyone to use their words. Sure. And now we're at a time in history where without anger and without violence, we're just going to stop doing that Maybe. and start using much more intelligent words. So weren't we talking about the Atma a minute ago? True. <laughs> So then I would the, say that my Atma inside me bows down to the Atma inside you and we try right. to connect on a spiritual level and not on the physical level. Now, spiritual is another word that I'm going to remove uh, from your vocabulary later on. Lovely. But right now, let's, let's ask what does the Sanskrit Namaste actually mean? Nam, so it's na, nam, Namaste. Yeah, Namaste. 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 Naman, Naman, to do Naman, which is to bow down. And Aste means I do it. I do, I bow down to you. So Aste means I bow down to you. It Again, also it's not the right, I'm not sure if it is the right English. So that's fine. So yeah. it's also na ma te, not me, but you. <laughs> okay. Okay. So it's a moment when it's not all about me. It's about you. No. What is the term for someone who's very selfish in English? What is the word we use to say that they have too much, they have a very big what? If they're very selfish. Self-centered? Big ego. A big ego, yeah. Okay, so what does the word ego mean? Aham, in, in Sanskrit you're asking or you're asking in English? Ah, that's it. But in English, what does it mean? It's an ego is, yeah, too much of self-praising, too much of self-worthiness. But we um, have no idea what self is. Uh, in English, we don't have self. In fact, if you look up self, it doesn't have any meaning. Oh, yes. It is himself. It is myself. It is always with the word. I'm not sure. But, if it is, there but there's is no, no definition of that self because you can't do that because Christianity doesn't have one. <laughs> Okay. So the dictionary can't have one either. Oh. So the word okay. ego is actually Latin and it means the sense of having an eye. Okay. Yeah, too much so of eye. Yeah. So should we get rid of our ego then? Yes. Should we get rid of thinking that we are an eye? Yeah. No. No. We are an eye. We are an atma. That's, okay, that's, okay, that's yes. I. You I, see, so ego is not the same as self. Right. Ego is not used that way in English. It's used, you have a big ego. But it, they should be understanding what they're saying is you have a big sense of self. Yeah. Well, my answer is, but all selves are the same size. Because the, the self is the Atma. So what is the thing in Sanskrit that describes when matter covers your atma and you get confused about who you are? What's that called? Body. Ahamkara. Ahamkara. Asha, ahamkara. Asha, that we are saying. Okay. Yes, ahamkara. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah. So, so now we're having a scientific conversation. Now we're having a scientific conversation. Before right. we were having an illiterate conversation. <laughs> true. Very true. Very true. Because now we're talking about the layers of matter that cover the Atma. So Gita says how many? Eight. Right. Ahamkara, Buddhi, Manas, then five, Akash, uh, Bayu, five Agni, uh, yeah, elements, yeah. Jala, yes, yes, Prithivi. Yes. So uh, that's science. So that Samkhya is scientific. Our scientists are illiterate. They don't know how to talk about their self because they call their self the atomic elements. So they're completely lost. They think that consciousness is arising from the atomic elements, but they can't prove it and they can't disprove it. So modern scientists in the Western world, I call the runaway abused children of the medieval Catholic church. They don't have the answers about who we are and what existence is. All they have is an analysis of the problem. They've analyzed matter. Right. But that's not the solution. So right. what's the solution? Tell me who I really am, please, Mr. Scientist. 
for which they have no answer. Yeah, they don't. Yes, I agree. Because they're in reaction to the Christian religion, and they're saying, I hate you. You're a mean mommy and daddy. Well, and actually, there's no mother. There's just a daddy. You're a mean daddy, and I don't like you, and I'm going to go be a scientist. So now I'm an atheist. This is what the Western civilization has done. So that's not a solution. That's another problem. You only believe there's matter and you can't explain consciousness. So when we go namaste, we're saying, I see that you're an immortal being. We're supposed to. Then why would somebody ask me if I'm a white Hindu if they see my Atma? Exactly. I, I'm sure you have seen those comments, right? I said, yeah, okay. I think <laughs> I, I wanted this a controversial and it, it, it good that reaction came. And because yeah. people have to understand that this is how the, um, the ordinary people, you know, in the world, or especially in India, they perceive this as when you say yeah, white Hindu, obviously their eyebrows are raised and they want to understand that why white and why Hindu. Absolutely. Yeah. So we might as well ask isn't he in a different cast? <laughs> right. <laughs> so now let's do cast. What does cast mean? Tell me the exact meaning of the word. Well, I know cast comes from Latin word and it's not exact. Oh, Portuguese, I don't know, but one of the other words. And it's Portuguese. exactly not as jat, jati and it's definitely not jati and varna. So it's not exactly the same. It was more to do with higher and upper, which was that class system, which uh, you know happened to be there in uh, Europe. Or I don't know in Britain. That's what I understand. And now they use the same thing onto India's jati system, jati and varna, and it is definitely not same as that. Now, please, you describe it a little better than what I'm telling you. <laughs> well, you did great. That's pretty good. So let's just step through it. Hmm. First of all, cast is a Portuguese word, and hmm. it means influence inherited from your parents. Mm -hmm. So do the British have a caste system? I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. They had a they caste did. system. No, 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 no. You misunderstand. They have a caste system. The they people do. who own the people who own the land in England are called lords and ladies. Yeah. And they are called that not because they have great qualities. They're not called that because they're smart or special. They're called that because they were born in the family that owns the land. Mm. And the land was handed over to them, specifically the eldest son. And it was only about 10 years ago in England, they made it the eldest daughter also. So in England, all the land that's worth owning is owned by human beings who inherit it from their father. And that's called a caste system. So let's be clear. It is England who has the caste system. A very clear, obvious, blatant caste system where Which all the land people? across England has a lord and a lady. Now let's ask another interesting question. So in Christian prayers we say our lord and in so many of the translations of the Bhagavad Gita Sri Krishna is called Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna. What does the word lord actually mean? I thought it was landlord or the owner. It's yeah, not it's actually the lord. It's, it's even better than that. It, it's from Old English, haflard and haflady. Uh -huh. And the haf part, hafla, it's H-A-L-F. So it's hard to say. Haflard, haflady is loaf, L-O-A-F, like a loaf of bread. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yes. And so haflard, and Haflady are the owner of the land on which the slaves are working, the peasants. And they're the ones who bake the bread. That's the lady, Haflady. And the Haflard, the Lord, protects the bread so no one steals it and then gives it out to the slaves. Now tell me that's not a caste system. Very clearly a caste system. <laughs> it, and this is what the Romans did. They baked bread and gave it out to the slaves and the poor people to keep from having a revolution so they wouldn't all get too hungry and throw down the system. So the word Lord means the caste owner of the land, land yeah. who totally unqualified with no qualification received it from 
being born in that family. Sounds like a caste system to me. So now, why is a British person telling someone from India that you have a caste system? Are you kidding? They should have answered, are you kidding? You invented it. <laughs> All right. What do you mean, we have a caste system? No, we don't actually. We have a more complex social system, but I'll tell you what we do do that you don't. When we educate children, we try to put them in the right occupation. And exactly. that's called Varna. Varna. That's called Not the, end the Varna. correct Varna. Mm -hmm. But Varna doesn't mean what you're born into. Yeah, true. If, 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 let's, let's think of it in common sense terms. What a Kshatriya is one of the three Varnas, right? Yes. There's four of them. Kshatriya is one of them. Yeah. So what makes you qualified to be a Kshatriya? Because you had certain parents? No, if you are a warrior, if you have any physical strength and you are doing into that kind of job. So you are a Kshatriya. So imagine that I'm a, a martial artist and somebody comes up to me and says, I'm going to hurt you because my family made me strong. Yeah. I was born I, in this family. I was born in this family, so I'm going to beat you up. I would say, stop talking and just try. Yeah, exactly. Don't, don't say nonsense to me. Don't tell me about your mommy and daddy. Show me your fists. Exactly. So the very idea that an intelligent civilization would think that you're a warrior because of which family you were born in is so foolish, no one should ever have thought it. You can't even pick up a sword correctly if you weren't trained. And you couldn't be trained because you were born in a certain family. You can't make an idiot into a scholar. You can't make a, a, a farmer into a warrior. Not that the farmer's an idiot, but the farmer's a farmer. That's mm -hmm. their skills. That's their ability. So I have renamed the four groups of Varna, professor, protector, mm -hmm. producer, provider. OK, sounds interesting. Now, those are four groups of workers. If you're good enough to be a professor, you'll talk to somebody and you'll talk to an intelligent person and they'll say, hey, you're pretty intelligent. You should become a professor. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so what do you think I should be, a farmer or a professor? <laughs> Obviously a professor. <laughs> oh, yeah, so into, the, into, the, in the, into the space of knowledge. So, yeah, so that means it, it shouldn't be difficult. And if I tell you I'm smart because I was born in this family, you'll say, well, let's talk for a while and I'll decide if you're smart. Let's see how smart you are. Yeah, so <laughs> let's see how smart you are, show me. Yeah, show so me. it's ridiculous yeah. to think that the Varna system ever came from being born in families. It was a way of organizing the functions of society so that it could you're getting the blessings of sun, Surya Devata. I'm getting Surya's darshan. Yeah, Surya darshan right on your face. I can see the sun which is set here is shining on you. <laughs> we have a close relationship. I do the 108 names of the sun every morning. Uh, looks like that. He's out there to bless you. Surya, <laughs> Aryaman, Bhaga, Tvastar, Pushan, Arka, Savita, Ravi. So what I was saying is that caste has been manipulated as a political word, right. as a part of this social control. And if anyone was intelligent enough, they would say, that's not caste, you dummy. Caste is when you receive property born in a family, but isn't that called an inheritance? And doesn't the whole world pass things on to their children? So the whole world is a caste system. In fact, I've renamed it, I call it casteism. The real problem in the world is that people without moral values have most of the money. True. That's our big problem right now. True, very true. And they're going to pass it on to their idiot children <laughs> who aren't qualified to use it properly, and they're going to go out and control the world. So why do we have money controlling the world? Shouldn't we have intelligence and wisdom and nobility and honor and truthfulness and love and compassion and caring? Oh, but that's a Vedic civilization. <laughs> right. Very true. Very, very so you true. See, uh, do you see what I'm sorting out as a conversation and how yes. I'm doing it? Yes. I'm so very this, this linguistic very training is what the Hindu community needs right now. They just need to take a few classes and improve their English, get 
good at defining the Sanskrit in their in English, and then they won't misspeak when they explain their own culture. Okay, and but I want to give you one more word for the people with all the money. It's casteism. The problem in the world is not casteism, although that's a big problem. That leads to casteism. Because if you inherit a very few pieces of material something from your parents, it doesn't change the world. If you inherit a billion dollars and you're unqualified to use it, you can harm the world terribly. So the problem is it's supposed to be the Barna system had a purpose. Well, it was the head of the social body, the protective arms of the social body, the productive part of the social body that makes all the goods that we need and moves them around. And then all the services that was the legs and feet of the body. But nobody hates their legs and loves their head. That's it, it's your whole body. So the Varna was a social body and Dana meant to circulate energy. It's not charity. It's the circulation of blood through the social body. Exactly. So, Exactly. So the Vedic civilization was a cooperative society that tried to use people according to their best nature and so on. I think so uh, the Vedic Yagna was the best example where every person in the society was involved, though there was Yajman who could be Kshatriya or a king and the one who's reciting, which is Brahman. But then rest, everything else was managed by all the other people, the merchants and the, uh, and every, uh, you know, so-called uh, Shudra, you know, as in the carpenter or the fruit seller or the grain seller, or I mean, every piece of Yagna was contributed by every section of the society, even the Chandal. I've heard that even Chandal's uh, contribution used to be there some or other way. So I think- well and then this is why we do namaste to everyone and not just the people we like. True. Very true. Because we're we're leveling the society. We're say, because a hunkara wants to say I'm better than somebody. But if I'm the Atma and they're the Atma, then I don't think that way. So isn't that called yoga? Isn't that what the Bhagavad Gita is all about? Hmm. Maybe we should live that way. Oh, so very true. Very true. you see. Maybe the people of India should just start saying namaste to everyone wherever they live in the world. And when the people say that are reasonable say, what does that mean? They say, it means I see you as an immortal being, as a beautiful divine who can't die and who's come here and I have great respect for you. And it means, see this, I'm going to stay balanced in my relationship to you. So I don't want to hurt you or throw you over. I want to get to know you. It's a, it's a very friendly culture. It's a user friendly. So what if every Hindu in the world right now just listens to this, passes it around and says, from now on, say namaste to everybody. Very don't go, hi, hi, don't go, hi, how are you? <laughs> don't namaste. And when they, if they don't like it, say, I'm sorry, you don't like being immortal. But that's how I see you. Lovely. In other words, you have to start playing with this. You have to get in the game. game. Very true, very true. I totally agree. As a Hindu as a Hindu, true. I'm so glad that we have, uh, you know, we, I mean, we are having this conversation because we have already crossed more than one hour and uh, time is always a constraint when you have a very meaningful conversation, but somewhere of course we'll have to end. So I'm so glad that you have joined us today. I'm sure my audience has learned a lot. Even I have learned a lot because uh, having the knowledge of linguistic you know, area and to understand where the word comes from and to find the root in Sanskrit language is very, very important. And that is the best way to save our culture and uh, our scriptures. So I'm so happy. Thank you so much. And please, yeah, please show, show me your, uh, the new Gita. I would love to see their well, cover picture. And um, I want to thank you and congratulate you, Vaishali, because you're, pre you're presenting a very intelligent, very literate viewpoint, and you're working very subtly. I, I saw also the uh, subtlety of you calling me a Caucasian, and that's why I said that's a great idea, because I knew you were playing a game for everybody to say, look, folks, can we get over this? Can we start seeing each other in a really different way? 
Exactly. And it's great work that you're doing. I def definitely think it's doing wonderful things. Krishna's blessings, you know, when he wants you to do it, he knows how to get it done. I don't think I'm qualified enough to do so. I have to pull it out, pull it up so long and for so much and so much in detail. I think it's only his blessings and maybe my previous life's karma, which is making me do this. Otherwise, the world where I come from is very hunky-dory, very light-hearted and, you know, that uh, party types, uh, lifestyle and uh, very feminine, uh, you know, I, I come from that background. So sometimes it comes out of me. I try to settle it down. Yeah. But then, it's time, speaking of Durga, it's time for the feminine divine to speak up again <laughs> and lead the world forward. And I, I do want to say that this Bhagavad Gita has the clarity that you're looking for, that you're trying to live and that I'm trying to bring out. It's not that I'm specially qualified beyond the other great acharyas, I'm nowhere near. I, I bow and touch their feet, every one of them. It's yeah. that I know enough Sanskrit to be dangerous and my English is clear enough that I'm useful at this moment for bringing this beautiful message to everyone in the world. And Hindu children need it. They need a simple, clear way to read. And the reason Bhagavan gave this particular book was so it's only 701 verses. So it, it's enough of a summary of all the great yogic wisdom, that sure. this is the book that everyone should read every day and have in their home. And this is the user's manual for being a Hindu. Right. So thank you, Vaishal. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, namaste, thank you.